Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth uh, ML for Audio webinar uh, in the series. Today I'm happy to, to welcome Ray and Jeremy from the Kensho team. They will be talking about PyCTCD code and speech to text decoding. Uh, so, just as a quick introduction to them, uh, Raymond Grossman uh, works as an ML engineer at Kensho Technologies. Uh, he specializes in speech and natural language domains. Uh, before working in Kensho, he studied math at Princeton. And he was an avid Kagler under the moniker uh, to train them is my cause. Uh, we also have Jeremy here. Jeremy is an ML engineer at Kensho as well. Uh, he has worked on a variety of different topics, including search and speech recognition. Uh, before working at Kensho, he earned a PhD in experimental particle physics at MIT and continued doing physics research as a postdoc at the University of Colorado Boulder. Welcome, guys. How are you doing today? Fantastic, I'm, thank you. Yeah, I'm doing well too. Yeah, thanks. And um, yeah, thanks for inviting us. Uh, so, so like Omar said, we're talking to you today about PyCTCD code and speech to text decoding. Um, and so the two of us are ML engineers at Kensho and, and Kensho is an AI company that was founded in two, uh, 2013 and then acquired by S the financial firm S&P Global in 2018. And um, so, so now we're, we've been working and using S&P's uh, huge amount of data to help drive a lot of the AI innovation within uh, S&P Global. And one of the products that we offer is called Kensho Scribe, which is a speech to text tool that will make transcripts of audio files. Uh, so we have some experience in the audio domain. So the way this talk is going to work is that I will give you um, an intro to CTCD coding and Beam search, uh, and then my colleague Ray will um, then do a walkthrough the, with the PyCTCD code package and some examples. Uh, so for the first part, uh, I'll give you an overview of some generic, uh, a generic speech to text pipeline and then review uh, CTC encoding in speech to text, which I believe you've heard of in a previous lecture, and then talk about how to decode CTC encoded output. And finally, go into details, a little bit of detail about Beam search, uh, which is what we're going to focus on today. Uh, so first, a review of a st pretty standard modular speech to text architecture. So the first thing, obviously, you want to do is start with an audio sample. So something like a MP3 file or a WAV file. And probably the first thing you'll want to do with this is have some pre-processing stage, which give you features for every chunk of audio that's roughly some number of milliseconds long. Uh, once you get those features, you could then pass the generated per time set features through some neural net model, something like wave to vec or Citrinet, uh, which gets a uh, per time step logit matrix back, which you can then use to, to analyze, that you then want to analyze. Um, and so this logit matrix gives typically will give you some like softmax logic predicting character probabilities for each time slice. So here's an example of one where the x-axis is the character out of a, um, a vocabulary of about 30 something uh, characters. And then there's a set of about 50 time slices uh, in, in this one that I'm showing you right now. And the logics represent, as I said, character probabilities, but with some twists. Uh, so first, typically in many of these, in this kind of architecture, the audio will be sliced into evenly spaced chunks of time and you will be predicting softmax logits for each of these slices. And this means that your output length is proportional to your audio length and not actually the text length that you want to output. And this is a complication that actually is driving uh, this uh, CTC, why you need the CTC process that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, so once you have this logit matrix, you then want to pass that into some sort of decoder or language model that will then take this you know, matrix and return some actual text, which hopefully is human readable and, and sensible. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. So the process of taking this softmax logit output and producing human readable text. Um, so ultimately, what the decoder model is doing is evaluating some sort of path through your logit matrix, uh, which I'll define here as a path being that you choose one character per e from, for each time slice. Uh, so here I, I've just chosen some some characters, and let's say this spells out the word decoding, and then you keeps going through the rest of the matrix. Uh, so then uh, from here you could actually define a simple logit base score that combines the probabilities of each character. So if we take logits, take your softmax log softmax of that, we can define a log uh, probability or some log score, uh, which is just the sum of the log like the log probabilities. 
And so given any path, you can then define some sort of score on it. Okay, so now I can get into uh, CTC encoding. Um, and CTC, if you've forgotten, stands for uh, Connectionist Temporal Classification. And like I said, there are some challenges in decoding these logits. So first of all, typically you'll have many more time steps than predicted characters. Uh, you need this because people speak at different speeds. So it needs to be, the, the time steps need to be small enough that you could actually capture you know, everyone's speech reasonably accurately. Um, and also in actual human text, you'll often get things like duplicated characters. So for example, in the word, the English word, hello, you have two L's. So you both have you know, repeated things from having many time steps, but also actually duplicated characters. So as an example, um, so ultimately you need a, a way to collapse repeated characters without eliminating duplicate, actual duplicates. So for example, if you have the word hello that appears, so someone spoke hello and, and it appeared the way it does in actual English with five characters, it, um, that's easy. But uh, if someone speaks much slower, maybe each of those characters gets duplicated. And when you actually decode this into text, you want both of these things to decode to the same exact word, since ultimately they represent the same word. And the way this is done in CTC encoding is you add a new character to our alphabet that represents a break between characters. Often this can be denoted as pad or just an underscore. Um, and so we can insert this new character in between some of the L's in the word hello. Um, and then we could try to decode this with a two-step process by what were we, uh, first you uh, eliminate any duplicate characters, and then you could remove this extra underscore character to get the, the word. Um, and so by that process, you can then take these two representations of the word hello and collapse them down into the actual English word. Um, and so this is actually what happens once you have some string to decode. Uh, but we start with this logit matrix, which gives you probabilities in all possible strings you can get out. So now we need to actually decode our, our CTC output. And there's a simple way you can uh, do this greedily, um, and uh, which basically just involves just you take the argmax of the character logic at each time step. Um, so you just take the most likely character at each time step and then run this two-step process of removing repeated characters and then removing this CTC break character. Um, and so this is very simple. It's very easy to code this up. Um, however, very often it's not optimal. In many languages such as English, you'll have things like homophones. So for example, you have the noun not versus the word not meaning negation. Um, also very often this might misspell things. It's probably not gonna learn a full language model that gives you perfect English every time. And also in many languages, you have plethora, a plethora of other small errors. So for example, some misspellings could happen because you have things like the letter F or the two letters PH or GH can all give you the same sound. Um, and I'm sure this exists in other languages as well. So then we could ask what happens if we have a model that hears the word for, but instead decides the best output is uh, P-H-O-R rather than F-O-R, where that might seem like uh, it gives you the correct audio, but it's not an actual word. Um, so if you're an ML engineer or data scientist, maybe the first thing you think of is that you just want to retrain your model. So you try to collect more data, retrain all your models and hope that fixes it. Uh, the problem with that is that it can be very, very time consuming and very expensive to collect data and retrain your model. And even then it's not guaranteed to actually, to actually work. So you might do all this process and find that you still have many of these errors. Uh, so then you need to think of what else can you do? Um, so there's two things you want to consider here. Uh, first, uh, we know a lot of information about human language. Can we actually inject information about language into our decoding to try to guide it to give us more natural sounding output? And also, uh, is there a way we can try to use maybe a slightly better decoding strategy than this greedy uh, solution? Uh, so first I'll talk about uh, language models and how we can inject language information into our output. Uh, so ultimately, uh, you know, because of these problems, we we need to uh, try to see if can we score how likely a given block of text is to appear in an actual language, given the fact that we have these logits that represent the audio that we heard, but we also potentially have a lot of natural text we could use to build a language model that we could then try to use to remove improbable parts of the predicted text. So if the most probable thing is actually it doesn't look very much like natural language, we could then maybe downweight that and upweight something that looks more natural. 
Uh, so a very common way to do this is with an n-gram language model, uh, which is more of a, a traditional kind of language model that has existed before deep learning became very uh, popular. But there's other language models you could use. Uh, but if you use an n-gram model, uh, basically it's a probabilistic model where given some sequence of words of size n minus 1, we want to predict what the nth word is. Um, and so this can be used to identify improbable shorter sequences of text that maybe would need to be changed. And again, we use it in conjunction with our logits or uh, audio probabilities so, so that um, we can try to weight everything by what the, logic mo the language model says. And so for the purposes here, basically a language model is going to be something that we can take some proposed text and output some sort of likelihood or some sort of score. Uh, so for example, if you show the English phrase, the angry brown cat, that sounds pretty much close to like natural English. So maybe that's going to give it get a pretty high likelihood or pretty high score. Let's say we just have some language model that outputs a score of 0.4 something. But then we could also enter some text like the angry cat brown, uh, which is sounds less natural. Uh, so that probably gets a lower score. It's not zero since maybe you know brown is the name of the cat. So it's something that could appear in some language just with probably a much lower probability than the previous text. So it's just a way to take any text and try to score it. And so for in a generic language model, maybe you can say the problem, you can decompose this problem saying the probability of some sequence of text is going to be the probability of each word given all the previous text that you saw. Um, and then what makes an n-gram model an n-gram model is that we limit ourselves. And so instead of taking all the previous text, we only take the previous n minus one words. Um, and we do this for each of the each of the words to get a probability on the whole text. Um, and so one of the reasons why you want to do this uh, is that generally you need to train these language models off some large text corpus. Uh, but if you have too many uh, words that you, you include, you just don't have any examples. So you just can't set a good probability. So you need to limit yourselves on only a small number of words. So that way you can try to build a decent a model with good probabilities on each of these, each of these sequences. Uh, so, for example, a bigram language model, which is n equals two, uh, we could say we could give it say the opening line of uh, Dickens, the Tale of Two Cities, which is it was the best of times. And let's say we add in a start and end character to our text to say this is the beginning, this is the end of it. Then, in a bigram model, the probability of getting our text our, our text would be something like the probability of getting the end of the sequence. Uh, given that the previous word was the word times, times the probability of getting times given the previous word was of, and so on. So in the, the bigram or n equals 2 n-gram model, basically your model just has to memorize probabilities of these pairs of words. So, you know, it just has to memorize a pair of words and not any long string. So hopefully you get a, your pretty good probabilities from like a decent sized text uh, set. But typically, you can go more than this. You can do three or four, maybe even up to, to five or so um, for n, but probably not much beyond that before you start just not getting enough examples to get good probabilities. And then we can try to incorporate this language model with our logits as we decode them. Uh, as we decode them. So when scoring a path with logits, really what you're trying to do is uh, assign a score to any given output text. You can then get the, the raw score of the output text given your output logits, and then add in some extra score uh, given your language model. And so the idea here is that if you have a very highly weighted um, piece of text, you will have a very you know, pretty high pro uh, score. So you'll have a very small uh, penalty here. But if you have a very poorly weighted text, so the text looks very unnatural, it will get a larger penalty and be down weighted. And so this way you can include language model information into your decoding of your audio. And then another thing we can do besides adding language models is that we can uh, try to see if there are better algorithms to use. So for example, given a language model that we have, if we want one, how can we decode our logits in a better way? Uh, so there is a true solution here, which is more accurate than the greedy solution. And that is you can score every possible path to your logit matrix um, including any language model information if you want to include that. And then you want to combine the scores of all your equivalent paths to get a, a total score for some text, and then take the highest scoring piece of text. 
Um, so this gives you an exact solution, more or less an exact solution. But the problem here is that this is exponential complexity. So even if you say have 32 output characters and say just 10 uh, output time steps, which potentially is not even a single word, even with that case, you already have something like 10 to the 15 paths to go through, uh, which means that this is just impossible to actually do. You just don't have the time or the memory to go through every single path in any realistic solution. Um, and also, it turns out probably in most cases, the vast majority of these paths will have a very, very tiny probability. So what we need is actually an intermediate solution. So something that maybe is more complicated than just taking the argmax at each time step, but also is you know, going to be less disastrously slow as actually trying to go and take every possible path. And this brings us to beam search, uh, which is an example of one of these and what uh, we use in our package um, that we'll talk about later. And so beam search gives us a fast approximate solution to this. And the idea is that we'll take the n best characters from our first time slice. So we start at the first time slice, take the best characters. And so we, this, we call this, we have n beams that we want to start with. So let's say we start with the letters F and P for our first time, time step. And then we go to the next time step and try to add a second character to each of our initial beams. Then we score these. And then we prune the number of sequences that we keep down to our desired beam width, which is this, um, this number n. So here, let's say we have n equals 2. So then the next time step, we go and have um, you continue with two beams. Then we try to add a third character, uh, score them, prune back down to n equals 2 here, and so on until we've gone through our each of our time steps. And so basically what we're doing is we're iteratively building paths through a logic matrix uh, but just keeping the highest weighted ones at each at each step. And so if you think about this a bit, you can see that this actually ends up essentially interpolating between the two extremes that I mentioned. So at a beam width of one, we just keep the highest weighted uh, character at each step, which is essentially identical to this greedy decoding, although maybe including a language model if we want to add one and any, any other bells and whistles that, we, that, that you might want to add to your decoding. Um, then at a beam width of infinity, where you include all possible paths, you hopefully end up with an exact solution. Um, so this is a way you know you can you can then optimize by choosing your beam width to try to give you good um, results while also being fast enough to actually be effective for how you want to use your your speech to text system. And then once we have this, um, like I said, you have to score your beams at each position. Um, so a little bit about that. So as I said, you're building paths through your um, logic matrix. And, and so I already mentioned to, to score a path, you just take can take you know the sum of log soft maxes of your of your logits as before. Uh, so this is what you saw before. Um, and then um, potentially you get multiple paths that give you the same output. So you want to actually sum your probabilities over equivalent beams. Uh, so you want to go over your beams, and here's a, um, the I here is, is an uh, indicator function where you just choose any uh, beams that give you the exact same output or the beams that are essentially equivalent and add together the, uh, the probabilities there. And that gives you the probability of, your, of given, so getting some output text. Um, OK, so that's what I wanted to talk about uh, today for just the theory of, of how to do this uh, CDC decoding. So as I said, uh, the CDC encoding is a pretty common way for audio models to output character information. So this is especially relevant in the case of modular systems. Um, it's not That's not the only architecture that's possible. And then the PyCDC decode package that you'll hear about next is a package that was developed to uh, decode CDC encoded uh, logits uh, with language model if you want to use it, and also using uh, beam search to try to find the best text. Uh, and so now I can uh, pass this over to uh, Ray to talk about PyCDC decode. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so PyCDC decode is, again, a Python package. I've included links to both the package and the code that will be used later in this presentation to generate some samples we're going to look at. Um, this should also all be available as information on the talk Git. Uh, so what is PyCTC decode? Basically, it is a package we developed at Kensho that decodes CDC encoded logits. 
it is Python, which means it's simple code and it's both easy to extend with new features and hopefully easy to use in common ML workflows. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about, you know, the benefits of PyCTC decode. It feels a little suspicious. So let's move on to the features. Basically, everything that Jeremy discussed in part one is implemented in PyCTC decode. Uh, we offer beam search to determine, you know, quasi-optimal output text given a logic matrix. We al also offer language model support uh, using KennelM currently as our backend package for the language model. And of course, if you want to do greedy decoding, you can do that with no language model just by setting a beam width at one. Uh, and we also offer some additional features that are useful. The first one of those additional features is hot word boosting. Basically, you can pass a list of hot words to your decoder and boost the probabilities for each one in a given uh, audio clip that you're predicting on. This is extremely useful in a lot of common speech to text scenarios. One example is early in 2020, when coronavirus and COVID became extremely commonplace phrases in our language, but there wasn't a lot of training data that included those terms, you could adjust your acoustic models to um, often predict these simply by using uh, coronavirus or COVID as a hot word and boosting the probability of them appearing in the language model. Um, basically, the way this is implemented is very, very similar to an existing language model. It just adds an additional penalty or score based on the hot words that you pass to our existing probability for any given beam. Um, we also offer a lot of benefits just in terms of it being available in Python and still having uh, comparable speed. Um, so the C++ package we previously used wasn't any faster than our package. And we achieved this by using uh, extensive beam pruning and also very efficient caching. Uh, we reject beams with particularly low probabilities, and we also aggressively cache partial results during calculation so we don't have to keep passing similar strings to the language model. Um, I don't want to throw any shade on the, the package that we were using previously, so it's just marked as other, uh, but you can see that we have comparable speed without sacrificing and even improving word error rate over the package we were using previously. Um, and there's a lot of other features we want to add to PyCTC decode. One thing that we have on the docket is potentially adding uh, some transformer-based or neural language models. Um, of course, these, this brings its own set of challenges. It's an additional high complexity model to maintain in any production pipeline. It also has high runtime. Um, but if you have anything that you think would be useful, feel free to submit a feature request to the GitHub. With the the background on PyCTC to code out of the way, let's get started with the actual package. Uh, so what do we need to get started? Well, probably the package for starters, but jokes aside, to use PyCTC decode effectively, you really need four things. And the first thing that you need is a text corpus to train the uh, language model on. And ideally, it would be the same text corpus that you use to train your acoustic model. Um, you also need an acoustic model. Uh, PyCTC decode can handle either byte pair encoded or character based models. And I think if you're looking for an acoustic model to get started, Hugging Face has all of your needs covered there. If you are using an existing uh, model, you also need the vocab set for the above model. And you need to make sure that your language model is trained on the same uh, vocabulary set. The text that is used has the same vocabulary set. And the final thing that you need is the language model itself. Uh, we currently offer support for only KennelM, which implements the ngram model on the back end. Uh, so for this talk, and if you're looking for a data set to get started, we use uh, SPGI speech. Um, this is, again, a bit of self-promotion, but this data set is pretty awesome. And if you haven't looked into it, you definitely should. It's uh, about 5,000 hours of financial audio and associated transcripts. Uh, for reference, that's about 5x the size of Libre speech, which is, you know, the main speech to text data sets that's been used in research for the past decade. Um, and it's basically consisted of company earnings calls that are split into short chunks, which allows for easy speech recognition training. Um, it, uh, it contains over 50,000 unique speakers with a variety of accents and speaking conditions, which makes it very comprehensive. And the entire train and vowel set are the result of manual transcription, which means it's very well normalized. It has a very polished orthogra orthography. And in general, it's 
it's a very, very strong data set. Um, I promise that any model you train using a, a 5x larger data set will probably perform better. Um, then you can, once you have a data set, you can pull in an acoustic model, um, BPE or character based. The only thing that you need here is a vocabulary set associated with the model that you're using. And then you need to normalize the text corpus for your language model so that it uses the same vocabulary as your acoustic model. Um, I've included a, an example snippet here. Uh, this is using the Hugging Face uh, wave to vec base model. Um, this both pulls in the model and gets you the vocabulary set. And then finally, you need a, a KennelM model. Um, KennelM is, is another Python package, and instructions for how to train the KennelM model with Speechy Speech are available in the demo repo. Um, again, and I can't stress this enough, making sure your vocabulary sets match is absolutely critical. If there's a, even a slight mismatch, it can lead to, to really, really strange behavior in the way these models perform. Uh, one example is uh, the hyphen character. If it's not included in one of the vocabulary sets, uh, what will happen is, is words that should be hyphenated, or if they're not hyphenated, probably delineated with a space, end up mashed together, which can cause some problems with the language model output. Cool, so once you have all these pieces, you can get started by making a decoder. It's a simple call to build CTC decoder. Um, and you only have to pass it the vocab in your KennelM model. Then once you have your decoder, you can decode a logic matrix simply by using a call to dot decode. Cool, so let's let's move on to some examples. I tried to pick a, a wide spread of examples for this presentation from those where the language model helps a lot to those where it doesn't. And hopefully the idea behind this presentation is that you'll sort of get a good idea for how language models tend to work in practice, the sorts of errors that they fix and the sorts of errors that they don't fix, and also what you can do to tune them and make them as effective as possible when you are using language models yourself. Again, all the code is available in the, in the demo repo. If you're curious, it's very approachable. It's not a lot of code and should be easy to get off the ground. Um, so let's start with some examples. Uh, the first example we have is one where the language model performs pretty well. And here is the audio clip we are going to be predicting on. I also want to remind everyone that any forward-looking statements made during this call are subject to risks and uncertainties, the most important of which are described in our press release and SEC filings. And let's listen to that one more time. I also want to remind everyone that any forward-looking statements made during this call are subject to risks and uncertainties, the most important of which are described in our press release and SEC filings. So this sample is pretty straightforward. It seems like most acoustic models should be able to predict pretty well on it. Uh, there's not a lot of background noise. The speaker is fairly clear. There's a little bit of static, but not too much. Um, so we have the ground truth which is I also want to remind everyone, so on and so forth. Uh, and then we pass it through the acoustic model and uh, use a greedy decoding to get back a, a predicted block of text. We get something that is indeed quite accurate. Um, it's almost identical to the predicted text. Uh, of course, our, the model that I use for this demo doesn't include punctuation or capitalization, so neither, neither of those are present. But the only two real errors it has are at the end of the text. It says press relief instead of press release, and it says SCC instead of SEC filings. So we can address these sorts of errors easily with our language model. If we pass a language model that you know, has seen a lot of financial text, it's seen both the phrase press release and SEC filings many, many, many times. And so it's able to correct both of these issues with our acoustic model very easily. Um, but there are also cases where the language model doesn't perform as well. Um, so let's look at a second sample. Thank you, Ivan. I'm now going to look in a bit more detail at what is, as Ivan said, a good set of results with better top line performance, margin expansion, and increased cash flow. Let's listen to that one more time. Thank you, Ivan. I'm now going to look in a bit more detail at what is, as Ivan said, a good set of results 
with better top line performance, margin expansion, and increased cash flow. Again, this is a pretty clear sample. I think that for the most part, it's going to be something that an acoustic model should perform quite well on and an appropriately trained language model should also be able to perform quite well on. This is the ground truth. Um, and if we pass it through and get a greedy decoding, we can see that the greedy decoding is actually, excuse me, is actually quite strong. It's almost entirely correct. We have um, only one error in this, and it's something that would, would ding your word error rate score, but it's not actually a huge error from a human perspective. At the end of the sequence, we have the words cash and flow merged into a single word, not the end of the world. Um, but if we pass this through a language model, then we actually run into some problems. So instead of the opening phrase, thank you, Ivan, it now returns, thank you, even probably because even is a more probabilistically likely word in any given sentence after thank you than Ivan is. And this is, this is an issue. Um, we'd like to minimize these sorts of errors as much as possible. And this is also the, the sort of error that a human might look at and think is not that great because thank you even doesn't make any sense as language despite coming out of the language model. It's interesting to note that in this sample, we would actually get a better WER uh, score, word error rate score, from the language model decoding than we would from the original sequence, even though the transcription is objectively worse, um, or maybe subjectively worse as a human, I'm not sure, uh, because it fixes the error with cash and flow at the end. So that is two words that were incorrect, which are now correct, and it only makes a single mistake on the first Ivan. Um, but still, this is this is the sort of thing that we would not want. Uh, it's worth noting that despite these types of errors, language models are still quite useful. Um, on our internal Val side at Kensho, we we get about a six percent improvement in our word error rate simply from adding a language model. And this is this is with a very large acoustic model that we trained on almost a hundred thousand hours of of audio. Uh, so that's a pretty strong endorsement that you know, language models and engram language models are very useful in almost any speech to text scenario. Uh, but that doesn't really change the fact that it still introduces some of these errors. Um, and especially in this case, what seems like a, a somewhat bad error in changing a, a phrase from readable English to something that doesn't really make sense. So how can we address these errors? Well, uh, the easiest way are through some of the features and the package. Uh, the first thing we can do is we can boost hot words for things that may be specific to our prediction domain. So for example, if if we're transcribing some sort of call, uh, maybe maybe a hangout or, or a, um, you know, any, any sort of earnings call where we know the names of the people on the call, we could boost those names. Um, or, you know, again, words like COVID that may be common, but not in our training corpus, we can boost things like that. Uh, the second option that we have is we can try and adjust the parameters to increase or decrease the weight on the language model. Um, and we can try and get a, a solution that seems more appropriate uh, for, the, for the actual prediction corpus that we're using. Let's, uh, let's look at the first solution and try hot word boosting on our previous sample. Um, so for this, the, uh, the ability to add hot words is very simple. We just create a list of words we want to pass. Um, it can be any list of words. And then we pass those through to the decoder and we add some sort of weight for these hot words. For this example, I've added a fairly high weight. Um, you probably want to be more subtle than that if you were uh, actually adding hot words in practice. But if we pass the same sample um, through a language model that includes hot words, uh, what actually happens is we take our our error, thank you, Evan, and it fixes it back to thank you, Ivan. Um, and this is pretty ideal. Um, I think this is obviously something that's very useful in many common transcription scenarios. Uh, you can use it in anything from a call with no speaker names uh, to adjusting your models to new corpi. Um, but again, this is something that can easily be abused. Uh, if you overweight words too extensively, it can lead to some very, very strange outputs where the, the language model will almost overwrite words that it probably shouldn't. 
Uh, so always worth both validating and having a visual check on these sorts of things. Uh, and then that brings us to our, our second method of improving language models, which is parameter tuning. Uh, and PyCTC decode offers two tunable params. Uh, the first is alpha, and basically that's just the weight on the language model versus the logits during uh, the fusion of the two. And beta is uh, a constant factor that is uh, the weight for the length score adjustment. It's sort of hard to wrap your head around what um, beta is doing, but it just makes the language model more likely to add or remove words in practice. Um, and keep in mind when doing any sort of parameter tuning on modeling pipelines that have more than one step, you need to be very, very careful with your validation. If you tune these sorts of parameters on your validation set, then you validate on that same validation set, you'll get inflated WR scores from what you would expect on a new and unseen test set, because you've basically leaked information to the language model. Um, and uh, this means that you should always, always avoid tuning on your validation set these sorts of parameters. Uh, a better way to set up a pipeline like this is to split your training set into uh, a vast majority of it should go into the data set used to train your acoustic model and your language model. And then you should keep a very small holdout to tune the parameters on your language model after your acoustic model and language model have been trained. And then you should have your validation set be completely separate from this entire operation. Um, and it's also really important to have a visual check on these sorts of changes while you're tuning. If the parameters are too high, you can still get a good WR. As we saw in our example with Ivan, it fixed cash flow and improved the WR, but led to a sample that looked really, really bad from a human perspective. Um, and this sort of leads to a fairly high embarrassment score, or I don't know, that's not a real metric, but uh, it basically leads to predictions where a human is going to look at it and uh, wonder exactly what happened to lead to that, which is never what you want in transcription. Uh, but concerns with validation aside, let's move on to an example and see how uh, parameter tuning can be deployed in practice. And here is the audio sample. Whereas then uh, in the industrial cranes and crane component business units. And I'm going to play that a couple more times. Whereas then uh, in the industrial cranes and crane component business units. Whereas then uh, in the industrial cranes and crane component business units. Uh, and this is a, a worse quality audio sample than the previous two. It's a little hard to hear if your volume isn't turned entirely up. Um, and it also is uh, less clear in terms of the, the accent in the speech. Um, and you'll note that the ground truth that is used in our data set actually omits the, uh, the uh sound. He says, whereas then uh, in the industrial cranes, and so on, but the, the transcription eliminates that. And this leads to some problems when we're passing it through the acoustic model. The model doesn't really know what to do with that situation. And so we end up with a transcription that is pretty bad. We get whereas T-E-I-N-A in the industrial grains and crane spelled incorrectly, components business units. And if we pass this to some sort of WR evaluation, it would score pretty poorly, maybe around the 50% mark, um, simply because there are so many words that are either slightly off or or just plain incorrect. Um, and obviously, this is the sort of thing that we would expect a language model to do uh, an okay job of fixing. And indeed, if we pass it to a language model with sort of default parameters, it performs pretty well. Uh, it comes back with more readable English Instead of this sort of nonsensical start, we have it correctly identifies where he has then in the industrial. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't fix the latter part of the sentence. We still have grains and grain components, despite the fact that industrial grains and grain components probably is a very unlikely or unrealistic phrase in the English, English language. 
Um, so how can we address this? Well, if we turn up the the input that our language model has, uh, you know, alpha upweights the language model and beta increases its its ability um, to add or remove words, then we end up with something that is that is even better. We get something where the first grain is actually fixed to cranes. Uh, and although it doesn't fix the second grain, it's still an improvement. Um, and you can actually continue tuning this and get to a point where it fixes both cranes and the second crane correctly. But if you turn it up too high, it starts to degrade performance in other areas. So it's a bit of a balancing act here. So these can clearly have a, a significant impact. Uh, but again, be very, very careful when tuning stuff like this. If you have leakage on validation, you're going to have a really bad time. And also, um, you know, anytime you're doing language like this, it's important to, to do some visual checking of the results at the end. And that is all that we had for you today. Uh, I hope that some of you are able to use PyCTC code in your own uh, speech to text adventures. And with that, are there any questions, comments, concerns? I guess we can uh, we can open it up. Awesome, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, that was a great presentation. Let me switch screens. Yeah, so just as a reminder for people that joined later, uh, if you're in YouTube, you can scroll down a bit uh, and there's the link to the forum. Uh, there you can ask any questions that you might have. Uh, later on, we'll uh, go over each of these questions We'll go over them now, but we'll also add some resources and pointers to the specific point in the video uh, because this will be recorded. Uh, so yeah, feel free to ask any questions. And additionally, uh, you can also find the GitHub repository uh, of the Hogan Phase uh, ML for Audio Study Group. Uh, here you can see the demo, the slides, uh, the link to the questions, and additional resources uh, for this topic. Uh, Having said that, thanks again for the great presentation. And maybe let's jump directly to the questions. Uh, so the first question is, uh, I was wondering how the hot word boosting is implemented. Is it simply changing the probabilities of the language model by a factor of x? Or is it something fancy? Yeah, so I think uh, it is It is not that fancy. So it's actually implemented after the language model. So the text is passed to the language model. And we have our score from the logit matrix, and it's added as an additional term onto the formula that calculates the beam score. So we have our language model score, our logit score, and then our hot word score. And they're all separate. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, next question from Bibi is, what is the future roadmap uh, for PyCTC code? Um, I could take that. Um, I, I think. Right now, there's not really a clear exact roadmap. Um, so, so there's been some changes to try to add support for some hugging face um, uh, code more recently. Uh, but I, I think really it's just um, figure out if the community wants a specific addition or uh, or something. We can we can think about adding that. So so if we want more integrations with different packages and things, uh, that would be something that we would certainly consider. Uh, but I think there's not necessarily a exact roadmap right now. Uh, so it really is up to the people who want to use the package to, to request things. Yeah, and I think there are a few things that we are going to try internally. Uh, we're definitely going to try, you know, transformer-based language models. Uh, and I think uh, over the next couple of months, hopefully have some updates there. But I think that I agree with Jeremy. The vast majority of things are going to be uh, up to the, the feature request from the community. If I'm a member from the community and I would like to request new features or discuss, uh, would the right place to go would be to create an issue in your GitHub repository? Absolutely, uh, yes. Yeah. Awesome. That Thanks. would be ideal. All right, let's go to the next question. I think these are actually three different questions, so maybe let's go one by one. Uh, the first one is, how many hot words uh, can we add to the language model? Yeah, so I don't think there's there's any sort of limit here, but I think that um, this is something that needs to be tuned. If you add too many hot words, 
it'll start to degrade the performance of the language model. I think that you really want to use hot words in very targeted scenarios, and you should try and limit them as much as possible. If you find yourself adding, you know, an enormous list of hot words, it might be time to look at either retraining your language model or retraining your acoustic model. Awesome. And uh, uh, may I go to the second question? Yeah. yeah, so the build for everything does not take very long. Uh, so if you wanted to run all of the code in the demo repo, including building the Kennelem model, uh, it would only take maybe maybe 10 or 15 minutes with the vast majority of that being setting up things on your own end. Uh, so, you know, changing the path to your own data set path, identifying uh, the vocab for the model you want to use, things like that. Okay, great. And the third question is, uh, can PyCTCD code uh, handle foreign languages such as Korean? Yeah, I think this is a difficult one. So I'm not going to pretend that I have extensive experience in doing speech text in languages that aren't alphabet based. Um, it seems like PyCTCD code should be able to handle any foreign language that uses an alphabet. Um, and it seems like as long as your language model is language appropriate, then it might be able to handle something like Korean, but we haven't tested it. Um, I don't know, Jeremy, do you have any? Um, yeah, I've never tested that. I, I believe Korean is mostly alphabet based, just a different character set. Um, and it, it's slightly, but I don't know, I don't want to say that I know the specifics of, because I don't really know much about the Korean language. Yeah, so I think as long as you have something that is alphabet or similar, um, I was expected to work if there's something like Chinese where you have thousands of characters which aren't necessarily phonetic I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't work that well but I don't know um, maybe there's some extra processes you need to add for that kind of case uh, but yeah that's something I'm not sure that'd be a, a great direction to put on the the repo direction okay <laughs> thanks uh... I think this one is not a specific question. It's just that uh, this person is interested in the specifics of the implementation and what is the math behind it. Uh, as I mentioned before, the presentation is recorded. The slides are also available, and there's also code as well as uh, the repository and additional resources. Uh, so yeah, I will leave this question. Uh, all right, so this one is in for a specific issue. Uh, so. The issue is difficulty seeing meaningful changes with hot word boosting. Uh, a user is having issues where he's not seeing meaningful differences when using hot words, even if upweighting the words to a very large number, like yeah, nine million, nine, nine, well, yeah. I tried this myself and uh, had the same experience. Can you please elaborate on this issue and if you have made any attempts to make it easier for users to fine tune their language models? Uh, sure, I could handle a bit on how this could happen. I don't know the, specific, the specifics in that issue. So I think that was from quite a while ago. Um, uh, but there's a few ways that this could happen. So, so first of all, as you're building beams in beam search, uh, to even get to upweighting a hot word, the beam needs to actually include that hot word. Um, and so potentially, if that word is um, too low weighted uh, and you just never build that beam, or you've pruned it, pruned it away, since there are some other parameters we didn't talk about involving you know, pruning away anything that's below some probability threshold, um, uh, then potentially that beam just never got built. And, and, and so even though the hot word is there, you never actually found it. Um, and so that's something that could be addressed by potentially, you know, changing the threshold, some of the pruning thresholds or increasing the number of beams will try to expose more results that maybe will will get you to that but but i think if you're doing this sort of approximate solution this just always probably going to be the chance that you just don't see that solution awesome thanks uh, all right so we have again a couple of questions uh, let me know if you think the scope for this first one might be a bit too big uh, so they are asking uh, please explain different approaches like peter b uh, WSFT and BIM search. Uh, what are the differences, especially in terms of accuracy and efficiency? Yeah, I don't know if we have you know, enough time to really get into this in depth. 
Yeah. Uh, maybe we could we could add some resources to alternative. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can uh, face GitHub. Yeah, and like I think, if I remember correctly, I think Viterbi is basically something like the exact solution. So you 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 are trying to dynamic programming build up every possible solution, or at least try to find the top ones, which. Uh, I don't know. That, I don't, I don't want to promise that I, I know the exact answer, but I think that's more like the less efficient but more accurate solution. Um, and then uh, yeah, WSFT. I'm not sure. Is that, is that W? Is that misspelled for finite state transformers or, or, or transducers? Or, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Or uh, well, that might be related to like the implementation of a language model. But, but yeah, I think that's something we should take offline or off like the call. Sure, sure, makes sense, thanks. And then they are asking how to choose the beam size for the beam search. Yeah, I think that um, in practice, it's, it's really just a trade-off between performance and, and um, speed. So the performance tends to level off pretty strongly. So if if you go back to the slide where we had the graph of performance and um, WR, the performance tends to strongly level off once you get you know up to beam widths of about you know thirty to fifty, and you can keep going higher than that with very marginal improvements. Uh, but I think that the way I would choose it in practice is to try and choose the fastest beam size that gave uh, like, you know, within a, an epsilon of the performance that you're looking for. Um, I think a good starting point is probably around 20. All right. Yeah. And this is kind of a follow-up question is, uh, is the beam size related to the acoustic model? Is it true that some models need a larger beam size for generating reasonable text sequences? Um, yeah, this can be, this can be a little bit true, especially when you get into the differences between uh, vocabulary-based and biparent uh, encoded-based models. I think that with biparent encoded models, you'll find that you need a slightly larger beam size to get um, the performance increases that you want. Um, but in general, uh, like, I don't think it's that significant of a difference. It's really hard to put exact numbers on this uh, on the spot, but. Right, thanks. And final question from Mariama is how to choose the number of support pieces in BP for decoding? So I'm not sure exactly what this, this question is trying to ask. Um, so your byte pair encoding, uh, your word pieces in the byte pair encoding should be generated prior to training your acoustic model and they should be set in your vocab. And the decoder, uh, the language model doesn't actually know anything about byte pair encoding. If you have a byte pair encoded vocabulary, it generates a score for previous words in the same way it would for a character-based model. And then when it has a, a new complete word to add, then it rescores the, the language. Um, so the, the number of subword pieces in your byte pair encoding shouldn't really have an impact on the way PyCGC decode functions. Although, yeah, I would suspect if you have like a really, really huge number of them, potentially there will be some slowdown, I would imagine. But but yeah, I, I, I haven't thought about how it meant at what point that happens. Right, thanks. Uh... Yeah, so this question from Iska is, during the training of a STT system, let's say with Tupac2, do we include the language model? Uh, so we do CTC decoding with LM during training? Yeah, so I think that um, this is an interesting question. So you can use it as an evaluation. So obviously, periodically, you want to do some evaluation during training to see how your model is doing. Uh, you could include a language model there, but I think you're probably just as well off doing some sort of greedy decoding. Um, they are very, very correlated. And I think the increase in complexity and, and runtime from having a language model called during your training loop is not going to be worth potentially the, the slight increase in accuracy. All right, thanks. Uh, all right, so we have two last questions for today. Uh, so the first one is, 
Can we use it for RNN-based and attention-based models to generate text too? I'm actually not sure I understand this question. I think anything that you know has a character-based logic matrix as an output should be should be you know amenable to using language model decoder on. But to be honest, I've never really tried. So um, I've never tr tried with RNN. It should work for something like uh, transducer, though. All right, thanks. And uh, last question is, is it possible to use acoustic models with phoneme output with PyCTCD code and add a lexicon? I have no idea, Jeremy. Um, so I think certainly, I think without a language model, probably it would be fine since that's just a different character set where you have phonemes and but then to get actual text uh, uh, I would imagine the language model would have to work differently where you'd have to somehow be able to analyze you know take a set of phonemes and produce words so maybe with a different kind of language model you can you can include that as well first but I, I think if you all you want to do is you know, output you know beam search through phonemes and output phonemes that I think that would work um, but yeah, I think that would probably require some of this would require some extra, I think, implementation of features probably. All right. All right. I, I think that's everything for today. Uh, just as a reminder for people watching, you can find the demo, the slides, the questions, additional resources as well in the GitHub repository. It's linked right in the video. Uh, this video is recorded. It will, it will be in the YouTube channel by tomorrow. And please join me in thanking Jeremy and Ray, uh, in the chat uh, and feel free to join the discord server as well uh, we are having meetings every one or two weeks we also have paper discussions for example uh, this thursday we have a discussion uh, on wave to back to uh, so please feel free to join and yeah ray jeremy thanks a lot for the presentation it was great thank you omar appreciate you uh, taking the time to set this up great right. thank you thanks see you everyone